six. Zoe flew through a gauntlet of elbows and tumbled through a revolving door. She emerged onto a noisy sidewalk full of rumpled people waiting for cabs to drift past in the molasses ooze of traffic outside the terminal. She thought about flagging down a cab herself, but in this traffic, her pursuers could just lazily stroll up a yanker out of the back seat. Instead, Zoe ran into the street, weaving and juking across six lanes of gridlock, clutching tightly her box full of annoyed cat. She dodged behind a steampunk van covered in copper tubes, wooden panels, and clockwork gears, only to almost get run over by a Coca-Cola delivery truck, its side panels playing a looping video of animated polar bears frolicking in the snow and urging everyone to drink Coke on Christmas. She shuffled between a customized pickup with a naked holographic woman dancing in the bed and a Vespa scooter that was straining under a trio of young Middle Eastern men. She finally emerged on the other side of the street and hurtled a stinking pit where men were trying to repair an oozing sewer line, only to have her left foot land in a patch of wet cement, marring a stretch of unfinished sidewalk. She stumbled and fell, and stench machine thrashed and hissed as his crate bounced, no doubt realizing how much better off he'd been on his own. Zoe ignored the yells of an enraged work crew, clamored to her feet, and pushed through the first door she saw. She smelled grease and curry, and found herself in a packed McDonald's bearing signs in both English and Hindi, glossy ads on the doors promising beef-free burgers made of fried vegetables and Indian spices. She shouldered through the employees-only door to the kitchen and bumped past harried Indian teenagers working a row of deep fryers, then crashed through another door and emerged into an alley that served as an open market of street vendors selling knockoff purses, prepaid phones, and AK-47s. She wove her way through chattering customers and vendors haggling in sprays of rapid foreign words. She took a corner and saw a crowd up ahead, thick enough to disappear into. The people were milling about in a city park, clumping around a scattering of steaming food trucks. There was a bandstand nearby and somebody was packing up gear, the aftermath of a concert in the park that must have just ended. Zoe cast nervous glances over her shoulder and headed for where the crowd would be dense enough to swallow her. She ran, sweat freezing on her face, feeling like her lungs had spouted razor blades. She shouldn't be in this bad of shape. She had quit smoking when she was 15. Zoe excused me to her way through a bunch of laughing black people around a picnic table, having what appeared to be a birthday party, and tried to blend in. She scanned the crowd. A dozen college kids ran back and forth and wired up glasses, playing some open-world video game, throwing magical fireballs at each other that only the other kids in glasses could see, dodging real makeshift tents where homeless people lived. She saw giggling Japanese girls in parkas who looked like tourists, a group of Indian kids around a park bench eating fried curry balls from insulated McDonald's boxes, and a pair of old homeless men arguing about something. Most of the rest of the crowd was lined up in front of food carts selling kebabs, pizza cupcakes, and ice cream churros. Nearby, there was another cart selling baggies of weed to help perpetuate the cycle of junk food commerce. Zoe decided to keep moving, putting more crowd between her and the street. She passed a group of drunk guys circled around a roped-off area where a chubby frat boy was menacing a confused, heavily sedated bear. She eventually found an empty park bench that was displaying a video ad along the back featuring a man in a skull mask holding a huge knife, advertising his services as a vigilante for hire, hostage negotiator, and bail bondsman. She plopped down on the bench and sat stench machine's crate at her feet. She tried to think. She had no ability to leave the city, short of just walking. Obviously, she wasn't getting back on a train, ever again, for the rest of her life. And she had no means to rent a car, not with her credit. She also had no place to stay. She literally didn't have enough limit left on her credit cards to pay for a room, even with the cash advance Will Blackwater had used to lure her out here, and they were probably having a good laugh about that, too. For a measly $500, they had gotten their hostage to come right to them. She could try hitchhiking along the highway out of town, hoping some stranger would get her out of the city without also murdering her or demanding sexual favors as payment. But the odds of that were even worse than usual. Her face was all over the news, and she had some kind of a bounty on her head. She had an urge to call her mom, but what could she do? Drive the 10 or 12 hours from Colorado on a suspended license in a beat-up Toyota that, oh wait, was now a fish habitat under a frozen pond? Zoe let Stench Machine out of her crate. He prowled the area around her bench, hoping to find a bird to eat. He wasn't much of a hunter, so when he saw that no birds had died of natural causes within five feet of the bench... He just gave up and lay down in the dirt. Zoe picked up the cat, 
hugged him, and tried to think of what to do. She glanced around. The Bank of America building that loomed over the park was wrapped in a 30-story tall animated weather forecast, showing cartoon rain drifting down over the next week. The Hilton next to it was one big promotional video boasting about their heated rooftop pool. The office building next to it carried a feed of the local news, which first covered the aftermath of some kind of small explosion, shots of shattered glass and debris surrounded by startled onlookers, but then cut to video of Zoe's big, dumb face. Zoe groaned and stupidly tried to pull the knit cap down further, as if obscuring her eyebrows would make her anonymous. She glanced at the people around her, seeing if anyone was paying attention. The building was showing a clip of her walking off the train just minutes ago, then a cut to her doing the trick with the whiskey, then to video from inside the train car, the news grabbing the blink feed from one of the people who had walked past her and Jacob on the way to the restroom. There were some cheers nearby in the park, and Zoe thought for a moment they were cheering her up on the screen, but she turned and saw the frat boy hit the bear in a headlock. The bear seemed mildly annoyed. Zoe froze. The feed up on the screen was now showing her, sitting on the park bench. Then it cut to another view from behind. Then another, closer. It suddenly dawned on her that she had just tried to disappear into a crowd in a world where half of the crowd was wearing live cameras. Every stranger was now staring at her. Clutching her cat and leaving its crate behind, she ran. Through the crowd, across the street, and into an alley full of pantsless women in heels, wigs, and imitation fur coats, she rounded a corner pawn shop with a sign boasting they would pay $75,000 for a human kidney and headed toward the only spot on the landscape that wasn't bathed in light, a roped-off construction zone around a low, oddly-shaped building. She climbed over orange barriers and ducked behind a huge metal roll-off bin full of construction debris. She peered back the way she came. Lights, hovering about ten feet in the air, creeping toward her. It was a whizzing device the size and shape of a flying barbecue grill, with twin blue beams piercing the darkness, sweeping the ground for its target. The lights hit Zoe's hiding spot and she ran, the drone tailing her, probably already reporting back to their father's mob, or the vigilantes, or the hobo wizards, or some other faction of thugs who also wanted to capture her and do unspeakable things. She plunged into the darkened construction site, tearing through yellow caution tape, shoes alternately sinking into sucking mud, then crunching through shards of broken glass that coated the ground. Looming ahead of her was a brick structure that looked like an apartment building that had been tipped onto its side. Exactly that, in fact, right down a useless sideways balcony and an ornate main entrance mounted fifty feet off the ground, it shredded awning flapping in the breeze. Zoe saw a faint light coming from an unglassed window low enough for her to climb into. She clambered her way through, entering what she thought was destined to be the most inconvenient building in the history of architecture. Stench Machine had finally had enough and thrashed out of her hands, darting toward the light at the end of the hallway that Zoe had climbed into. A sideways hallway. Zoe was standing on a painted wall. To her left was a tiled floor. To her right, light fixtures and acoustic tiles. She moved gingerly down the hall, stepping around open doorways at her feet. Above her was an identical row of numbered doors that only a gymnast could enter. From behind her came the glare of lights and the angry bee hum of four rotors. The drone was following her in. Zoe jogged deeper into the absurd sideways building, kicking debris that had landed on the floor slash wall, chunks of furniture, broken table lamps, a shattered toilet. She tripped over a fire extinguisher box and nearly plummeted into one of the floor doors. The drone was right on her now, and Zoe scrambled back to the emergency box, yanking the fire extinguisher free. She advanced on the whirring drone and, letting out a karate yell, swung the fire extinguisher. She knocked the little bastard right out of the air in a shower of sparks and chunks of shattered plastic. Something burst out from the guts of the machine as it crashed to the floor, bundles wrapped in foil. Curious, she picked up one of the bundles. It was warm, the size of a burrito. She unwrapped it. It was a burrito. She kicked over the broken drone, one rotor still whirring uselessly in its plastic housing. In bright yellow letters on the side, it said, Halatico, find Mexican food, delivered to wherever you're standing. Below that was a phone number and a web address to place orders. The drone itself was painted the red, green, and white of the Mexican flag. It had a festive sombrero glued to the top of it. She heard voices from down the hall. Zoe turned, seeing no one. The faint words were echoing from the direction of the lights at the end of the hall. Zoe moved cautiously along the wall, which sloped increasingly to her left as she went, as if the whole structure had a slight twist to it. 
She whispered a call for stench machine, which she knew was useless even while she was doing it. She found the source of the light, pouring up from an open doorway in the floor below her. The top of a ladder was visible, obviously having been propped up there for someone to go down into the sideways apartment without falling in and breaking their neck. Stench machine was perched at the edge of the doorframe, peering down inside. Something grabbed the cat. In a blur, he disappeared into the opening below. Zoe ran to him, glancing back one more time to see if anything or anyone else had followed her into the building. She reached the open door, crouched, and peered into a lit chamber full of harsh shadows and debris. She yelled for the cat again, which, again, was stupid, because even if he responded, he wasn't going to climb a ladder. Even if cats in general could climb ladders, she was pretty confident that hers couldn't. So, she climbed down and found herself in a broken, sideways dining room. There were shattered windows on the floor, showing off a view that consisted of nothing but impacted mud and dead weeds. Furniture was tossed around the wall. Above her, to the right of the door she had just dropped through, was a sideways kitchenette with a bar. Two large, filthy Latino men used the bar as a bench, their muddy work boots dangling over the black marble countertop. Zoe turned and saw four more men standing behind her. One was holding a sledgehammer, another a pickaxe, another a regular axe. The fourth, a stocky man with Spanish words tattooed on his forearms, cradled stench machine in one hand and held an unlit blowtorch in the other. They all stood in silence for a moment, under the dim glare of a work lamp that lit the room like a medieval torture dungeon. The man who was holding her cat said, You lost, chica? She was just so, so tired. She gave the latter a look, but she, she wouldn't make it up two steps before they grabbed her, as if she could leave without stench machine anyway. Zoe sighed exhaustedly and said, People are after me. I just need a place to hide. You guys got this area here, and that's fine. It's a big building. I'll find another room, but that's my cat. I'd like him back, please. The stocky man said, We can't let you do that. One of the other men said something to him in Spanish, and he answered in kind. Zoe said, Just let me have the cat, please. And then where are you going to go? Somewhere else, please. Her phone rang. Thinking that somehow this could be a rescue, she pulled it out. The hologram of Will Blackwater blinked to life once more, floating above the phone in the dim light of the room. Everyone around her reacted and started bantering with each other in Spanish. The stocky man with Zoe's cat let out a harsh laugh. Zoe hung up on the call. The stocky man looked her up and down. You're not from around here, am I right? No. And you got no place to stay. No friends, no family. That's why you're trying to squat in a horizontal building. Zoe didn't answer. Instead, she wiped tears from her face and thought about how much she just wanted to go lay down somewhere. So tired. He said, Make you a deal. I'll give you a ride wherever you want to go. Maybe even give you something to eat. But you got to do something for us first. Two of the men started talking to him in Spanish, talking over one another, insistent. The stocky man gestured with the blowtorch and said, Calate! He turned back to Zoe and said, And you gotta do it for all of us. So... Throughout these next few chapters, I'm definitely trying to expand with voice work and potential accents, so bear with me. I'm not trying to be offensive or perfect here, but I figured I'd just, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, so why not give it a shot? So, without further ado, 7. Behind the sideways building was a row of mobile homes parked haphazardly in the shadow cast by the dancing lights of downtown Tabula Rasa. Inside one of the trailers, five of the men were standing around the cramped living room. Zoe and the stocky one with the tattoos, named Rico, were in the bedroom. Rico sat upright in the bed and Zoe said, Now the head, hold still. She set the phone to scan and held it next to the man's right ear. She slowly moved it in an arc around his face. She checked the scan and tapped the screen and told it to save. Okay, Rico said. So that's it? It's got me in there? So I call somebody, it looked like I'm standing there in front of them, right? Well, you look like you're a foot tall and standing on their phone. It's not like Star Wars, it can't project you in the middle of the room. You'd need a projector on the floor for that. Or the glasses. The glasses will make it look like the person is right in front of you, but they'll make you look like a dork. They've been at this for half an hour. It had turned out, after a lengthy and embarrassing discussion, that Rico and his crew were not, as Zoe had thought, a roving gang of rape bandits. 
They were the first wave of a demolition crew hired to recover anything and everything of value from the sideways building. Copper wire, plumbing, undamaged fixtures, before the structure that had once been the Parkview luxury apartments would be demolished without ever having seen a single tenant. Aaron, get in here! We'll do Aaron next, then we'll be done. Thanks for doing this. Bought these for the crew a month ago, but the hologram thing never worked. Made everybody look deformed, like funhouse mirrors. Rico dialed from his phone, and Aaron answered as he was walking through the doorway. A hologram of Rico's squat frame popped out of Aaron's phone, and Aaron said, Yay, it works! See, now you just got the hire Zoe to hang around you 24 hours a day, for when you inevitably break it again a week from now. To Zoe, he said, Yo, why does your cat smell so bad? Before she could answer, Rico said, If I'm sitting down, then why am I standing up in the hologram thing? It plays your face in real time, but your body is just a standard animation. When you call somebody, your mouth and face will move while you talk, but you'll always be wearing what you're wearing now. Oh, why? Zoe started to answer, but Aaron cut in. So if I called you while you were taking a dump, I don't got to watch you. Zoe made Aaron stand in the center of the room, just as she had done with Rico. She stood back a few feet and started scanning Aaron's body. Rico said, Suck in your gut, Essay. You see how fat they looked in mine? This thing adds 20 pounds. It ain't the phone, Essay. Zoe said, So, I, I don't understand. That building just fell over? Perfectly intact? Could have been way worse. If it had fallen the other way, it'd have taken out the Rand Hotel, like Domino's. Aaron said, Inspectors in the city are a joke. Everybody's dirty. Nobody's taking time to do it right. Hey, Parkview was built to code. It's what they did next door that doomed it. They started digging out the basement, but they were too close to the foundation here. They dig and dig, and one day you got 20 stories just falling gently on its side. I can got drunk and stepped in a ditch. Concrete pilings snapped like toothpicks. Sounded like cannons going off. Zoe finished with Aaron, and he called Rico's phone to test it. His hologram popped up and Aaron said, Yo, it does make you look fatter. Zoe said, You can actually download any body you want, or outfit you want. Make yourself into a muscle man, put a little tuxedo on it to class it up. A skinny guy with a mustache, the oldest of the group, popped his head in the bedroom and said, Why is it taking so long for the burritos to get here? There was an awkward silence. Zoe finally said, Oh, that was for you. I might have crashed it. I thought they had sent it after me. You thought somebody sent a burrito helicopter after you? I thought it was a security drone or something. What did you do? Nothing. Well, I helped drown a man and set another man on fire and vandalized that restaurant's toy helicopter, but all that was after. My biological father died and I'm in town to settle his affairs, but now they're trying to get me into his safe or something. It's a big mess. He was, uh... Zoe trailed off as the expression on every face in the trailer froze. What? Rico said. Get Caesar. Confused, Zoe said. This town has a Caesar? No, no, that's just his name. You know, the whole world's looking for you, right? 8. The Blink Network encompassed some 120 million cameras in the United States alone. Along with the millions of live feeds broadcasting from glasses and pinned-on cameras, Blink also included hundreds of thousands of indoor and outdoor security cameras, in addition to most car dashboard cams, which standard on every new model since 2020, and a swarm of aerial drones owned by police departments, TV news channels, and tens of thousands of random voyeurs. At any given moment, 98% of these feeds were broadcast in absolutely nothing of interest. But Blink wasn't just a bunch of cameras. The nerve center of this sprawling mass of electronic eyes was a software algorithm that made sure the viewer always had something to watch. So if you logged into Blink from your phone or computer, it greeted you with three general categories. People, places, and events. Once you were in People, you could jump into your best friend's camera to see what he was up to, or log in to see what pop star Latrell Larange was doing with his Thursday evening. If you had wired up glasses, you could overlay your view with their feed, literally see the world through their eyes, blotting out your own reality completely. If you chose places, you simply told Blink where you wanted to be and it'd give you the most popular view of it. Even if you wanted to see Mount Everest, you'd jump into the feed of whichever climber had the most interesting view at the moment, or whichever one was having the most dramatic near-death experience. Events, however, were the real star of the show. For example, 
if the aforementioned pop star got high and stabbed a dancer at a nightclub, as had happened four times in the previous year, then the Trail Orange has stabbed another stripper would appear as an event on Blink within a few seconds. Then Blink could drop you into whatever feed had the best view of the situation and would continue following the event from camera to camera as the mostly nude man with a massive orange afro fled from the club, stole a car, led police on a chase, and attempted to board a private jet to Mexico. As long as there was a working camera in range, you could watch the drama unfold in real time, the view hopping from one feed to the next. If things were moving fast and there were a lot of cameras around, the view jarringly switched every few seconds, which was disorienting as new viewers and why everyone had started calling it Blink years ago. The result was that the network had become a massive breeding ground for spontaneous reality shows that organically popped up within that worldwide nebula of camera feeds. The event listings updated in real time with everything from drama in your social circle, cat fight at Rob and Gina's wedding reception, to worldwide news, hostage standoff in Kyoto Burger King. A lot of this was new to Zoe, and it had to be explained to her as she sat there on the sofa in the construction crew's trailer. She didn't own a blink-enabled device, as it seemed absurd to imagine anybody would want to watch her serve lattes and mood-enhancing teas to rednecks. She didn't really keep up with the feeds, either, as she thought Blink was still just for creepy people to broadcast upskirt videos of women on the bus, as it had been when it was new. This is why Zoe didn't realize that for the last 18 hours, she had been the star of a viral Blink event that at the moment was being followed by more than 20 million people. The work crew in the trailer knew, however, because of Caesar. He was the youngest member of the crew who, according to Rico, had been following Zoe's story religiously from the start. Rico called Caesar away from his task of ripping copper wire out of another part of the building, and when he walked through the door and saw Zoe, there were a few seconds of confusion, followed by pure, starstruck awe. Caesar uttered some kind of Spanish curse and clapped his hands and said, So who gets the five million? Zoe said, Wait, what? Is that the bounty they have out on me? Caesar said, Girl, you don't even know what's going on, do you? I've been traveling since seven. I'm out of the loop, apparently. Caesar took over the controls on the wall screen and scrolled to an event listing called The Hunt for Livingston's Key. The icon for the show was a picture of Zoe's face. She sighed and said, oh, Already this is ridiculous. Okay, Caesar said. It all started when that warehouse blew up last week. Right after that, this rumor floats around that Arthur Livingston had a vault, okay? But here's the thing. Nobody can find the key because he hid it somewhere. There's talk that there are all these clues hidden around and everybody's obsessed with this mystery. Now, nobody even knows what's in the vault, okay? Some say it's bodies of people he's had killed, some say it's gold, some say he's got a woman trapped in there and she's only got 24 hours worth of air. It's all crazy rumors, you know how Blink is. Or maybe you don't. Anyway, so then this huge offer pops up on the skin wall. The what? Uh, the, the, uh, board. The underground one where people post illegal bounties for freelancers. So an offer goes up, okay? A million for the key to the vault. It's from Livingston's own people, which is huge, because it confirms that the whole story is true and that they don't got the key. Blink goes totally wild with this. For days, the crazy stories are flying around, all these treasure hunters promoting feeds claiming they know where the key is, saying it's in some abandoned cathedral or a cave out in the desert. But it's always just a big show. Nobody ever comes up with the key. And meanwhile, the hype over this thing just keeps building and building, millions of us watching, everybody talking about it. Then finally, this morning, pow! Big plot twist, okay? The key ain't in town. The key is in Colorado, with a daughter that nobody knew Arthur had. So, this whole thing is over some blink rumor? Can I just look into a camera and tell everybody I don't have the key? You do have it. Caesar pointed at his temple. Up here. What, like a combination? Because I don't have one of those either. No, no, no. The vaults the rich people got now. They don't open for keys or combinations or nothing like that. They open for people, okay? Fingerprint scans, eyeball scans, that sort of thing. Livingston's vault is one of a kind. It has a scan that goes right into your skull, reads your brain neurons and synapses, all that. And Livingston set his vault so it would open for one person and one person only. You. And he did this knowing it would make me a target for every greedy psychopath in the country. Zoe thought about all the strangers giving her glances on the train, the crush of reporters as she was being escorted to a gruesome death. She shook her head and said, 
That man was cancer on two legs. So you were watching this the whole time? Everybody was. And all eyes were on you. All these treasure hunters and crazies all heading your way. And the rest of the world watching them to see who gets to you first. Everybody on Blink forming up into teams. Fans rooting, rooting for their guys to win. And then it gets really good. This other contract goes up, outbidding Livingston's people, okay? Three million. Some other crime family. They want the key for themselves. So now you've got a whole other faction of scumbags in on the action. And everybody's heading off to Colorado. And then that motivates all these white knight types who want to save you. All head out to converge on your location. Zoe thought, huh, and that whole time I was sitting on my sofa watching wildlife documentaries and failing to dye my hair. But the problem is, he continued, they got the wrong town. They think you're out in some suburb around Boulder, okay? Ah, nobody knew I'd moved. So everybody's trying to nail down your current address, but this wrong cock with mechanical jaws figures it out before anybody. So while everybody else is turning over every stone in the wrong town, this guy is sticking out your trailer, just waiting and watching. And then he turns on his feed, and then there's that crazy car chase, and the thing with the ice. Well, you know, you were there. So the next time you picked up was when you boarded the rail. So then all the hunters and crazy swarm the train station here, waiting for you to show up. But a few guys get smart and go to Salt Lake, thinking they could get on the train with you. Two of them made it. Two? Ah, right, the soul collector, he was one. The other was, of course, Jacob. He hadn't been hitting on her. He had been there to collect the bounty, and to shoot an impromptu reality show about it. She said, So that explains the thing with the people who can shoot lightning out of their hands. Three different people in the room said, The what? The bad guy on the train. He could shoot electricity from his fingers. Is that something people just do here? Rico said, Nobody I know. It seems like it'd be dangerous to take a leak, Zoe said. Never mind, forget I asked. So, whoever turns me into Livingston's scumbag mob gets a million, but whoever turns me into this other group of bad guys gets three? Make that five, said Caesar. Look. He brought up a list, and at the top, just above the one million dollar offer from Livingston Enterprises, was an updated offer of five million dollars. The name next to the bid was, Who's Molech? Zoe asked. The response with a series of nervous glances. Let's put it this way, said Rico. Even if the people in the city didn't need that cash, they'd turn you in just to get on his good side. You don't want to know what he does to people who get in his way. Though if you do want to know, I can bring up the videos. He likes to do it for an audience. Got a creepy fan base on Blink. These Team Molech guys were cheering the loudest when the hyena started broadcasting from outside your trailer, throwing up a lot of suggestions about what he should do to you. Do I want to know how many people are on Team Molech? Caesar said, It's a lot, but, you know, not all of them are psychos. Probably. Some just doing it for the shock value. Still, if they saw you in public, they'd report your position without a second thought. Then they'd pop some popcorn and watch Molech's people tear you apart on camp. Rico cut him off. Enough! Caesar, you got to learn when to stop talking. Zoe went cold but remembered that whoever got to her first, it was really her father who had murdered her. Rico squinted at Zoe and said, And you, get that look off your face. I got a wife and four kids. I'm going to bring home a suitcase full of blood money. Where do I tell them I got it from? Aaron said, I'll take your share. Man, your mama would string you up, and she'll know where you got the cash because I'll tell her. Caesar said, I hate to tell you, but it's either going to be us or those guys. He gestured at the screen where the feet had switched. They are now watching a half dozen flamboyantly dressed men packed into the back of a van. One guy had a red mohawk and was covered in tattoos and was sharpening a scimitar. Another had what looked like a bazooka with war slogans painted on the side. The guy next to him looked like he had covered his body in glue and rolled through a knife store. At the bottom of the feed was a logo that said, League of Badass. Caesar said, uh, They're in the van, on their way to Parkview, right now. The feed on the screen cut to a dash camera on the van, which showed they were rounding the park, the collapsed apartment building sweeping into view ahead. Then suddenly, the feed went black. Caesar said, They're jamming us, so we can't watch how they approach. Smart. Zoe scooped up the sleeping stench machine from the sofa and said, Where can I hide? Is there a place they can't get to us in the sideways building? Rico said, We told you, you can't go back in there. It's not safe. The place, it's falling apart. We don't even let the crew go off unsupervised. If you stay here, we can... Wait, Zoe! She was already heading for the door. 
These people seemed nice, but she thought there was no way they'd walk away from $5 million when it was between that and fending off a bunch of high school dropouts with military-grade weapons looking to create a shootout for their blink show. She yanked open the door of the trailer. Standing there, blocking the view of everything beyond, was an enormous, bald black man in a suit that was an expanse of dark pinstripes around a white shirt and a bright purple tie. She had seen him before. He was part of the entourage of fancy suits who had showed up at the train station with Will Blackwater. He was one of her father's men. 9. My name is Andre Knox, and I'm alone and unarmed, he said, politely but with some urgency. If you want to frisk me, I'll let you, but you gotta hurry because there's a lot of me and we don't got much time. And don't be alarmed if I get aroused. Zoe made no move to do this, so instead, the man opened his jacket, showed there were no guns dangling in holsters, then lifted the tail and gave a twirl to show no weaponry was stuck down his pants. The interior of his suit jacket was the same garish purple silk as his tie. He faced Zoe again and looked past her, at the nervous men standing behind her. He nodded and splayed his hands, as if to confirm that everyone agreed he was unarmed. He straightened his lapel and said, Now... I know that assurances mean nothing from a stranger, even one with as honest a face as mine, but I got reason on my side. You do know why we need you, right? The thing with the vault, it has to scan my head to unlock. That's right, and it only works if you're alive. It will not unlock for a dead brain by design. That means that my associates and I care more about keeping you alive than perhaps anyone on Earth, aside from you and your mama. As far as assurances go, that's about as good as you're going to get in this town. Zoe met the huge brown eyes of the man, then glanced back at Rico and his crew. She said, I I'll go along on one condition. I want it made official that the guy behind me caught me and brought me in. His name is Rico Hiera. I, I want him to get the bounty. Done. The five million, I mean. Done. Come on. Rico started to voice a nervous objection behind her, but she was already moving, Andre ushering her along toward an elegant black sedan. He opened the passenger side door for her and she plopped into a leather seat that immediately conformed to her lower back and butt, like sitting in a punch bowl full of jello. Without her touching a thing, the seat raised her up and forward two inches. The dashboard lights blinked on, and the navigation overlay on the windshield made it look like the road in front of her was glowing yellow, tracing the route they would take. Zoe nervously looked behind her. Through the rear window she saw headlights bouncing across the construction site, heading right toward them. The van of the heavily armed freelancers who called themselves the League of Badass was coming to collect the bounty that would make their careers. Andre glanced back at them and said, You mind if we lose them first? I guess not. Well, hold on. Andre picked up a coffee cup from the console and sipped it, then said to the car, Bentley, lose these guys. The Bentley was way, way better at car chases than Zoe's half-dead Toyota had been. The sedan launched itself down the dirt lane, wrapping around the rear of the toppled building. The Bentley was way, way better at car chases than Zoe's half-dead Toyota had been. The sedan launched itself down the dirt lane, wrapping around the rear of the toppled building. They were rolling across ruts and gravel and debris, but no bumps or even noises made it into the interior of the car, floating along, a bubble of luxury isolated from the world. One of the crazies behind them leaned out of the van and fired a machine gun, little gleaming brass shells twirling away into the night. Zoe yelped, but Andre just sighed and sipped his coffee. A spray of bullets left a row of little spiderweb marks in the rear window. As Zoe watched, the wounds in the glass healed themselves, the circular cracks shrinking to white pinpricks before disappearing completely. The Bentley found the street along the park and merged into traffic, dodging in and out of taxis and scooters and garish custom vans. Andre sniffed and said, What's that smell? That's your cat? He has some kind of skin problem. You don't look hurt, but I should have asked you anyway. Are you hurt? She shook her head. Andre continued, Now, this is perfectly understandable, but I'm thinking you misconstrued what occurred on the train. Will is the best negotiator I've ever known, and you gotta understand that to have any chance, he needed to get you on the scumbag side. Right, just like you're trying to get on my side now. The Bentley smoothly took a corner at top speed, the rear wheels sliding, then regaining traction and launching them forward again. Andre had to momentarily pause his coffee drinking. Behind them, the van tried to make the same curve and flipped over, smashing through a storefront. Zoe was disappointed that the van didn't explode into a fireball like on old action movies, but that was one of the downsides of electric car technology. Andre glanced back, satisfied at the outcome. 
then settled back into his seat and rubbed his whopper head. He said, My point is, none of that stuff on the train was supposed to happen. We sent a car like we told you on the phone. We couldn't come up with a limo, but we sent a nice sedan. Not as nice as this one, but still a better ride than the train. Car showed up. You weren't there. She shrugged. I don't know if I could trust you. Still don't. I wanted to find my own way. I guess there's no point in telling you why we didn't want you to do that. Seems pretty apparent now, right? Because you offered every violent nut job in America a huge pile of money to find me? Well, in fairness to us, the moment word got out about the vault situation, some of the city's shadier characters put out a contract to bring you in. Our contract was simply us trying to outbid them. We were telling the truth, though. The city really is the safest place for you. You saw for yourself, the bad guys own cars and maps, and your daddy's place has a hell of a lot better locks than your trailer. Why not leave me out of it completely? Why couldn't that man just leave me alone? The only one who could answer that question is no longer with us. And his passing, well, it has thrown things into turmoil. More than you know, even. If on the day of the Lord's judgment you want to find your daddy and punch him in the gut, I'll hold his arms back while you do it. So this vault has, what, all his money in it? Rich people don't actually have big physical piles of cash they keep around, especially somebody like your daddy. He's got stocks, bonds, commodities, and land on top of land, far as the eye can see. Plus, there's offshore accounts, shell corporations, Lord knows what else. And I mean literally only the Lord knows. What's in the vault are other assets. That's probably all I should say. So it is criminal stuff. You really didn't keep up with the news about your daddy at all. He was a pretty famous dude. No, I avoided all mention of him like the plague. Well, he wasn't as bad as you think. Mostly, he just owned land. Got an on-the-ground floor of Tabula Rasa. He owns a lot of them towers downtown, half the casinos, all of them housing developments out east. We're talking land that doubles in value every six months. And it's all legit. He was kind of the Bugsy Siegel of Tabula Rasa. I don't know who that is, but don't bother trying to sugarcoat Arthur Livingston. I know he ran prostitutes. It's how he met my mom. I know he skated on prosecution over and over because the witnesses disappeared. All that was true in his youth. I don't deny it. But he was trying to get out of all that. He was a big political donor. And a bunch of charities. We're mostly just the real estate now. There was a pause and Andre sipped his coffee. Mostly. So, you get enough dirty money and then you can, what, spend yourself clean? Well, yeah. This suit is Hugo Boss. That's not just the name of a brand, it's the name of a dude. A German dude who got his start making uniforms for the Nazis. Ferdinand Porsche, as in the fancy sports cars. Same thing. I could take you back home to South Carolina and show you the fancy homes of rich folk who got rich six generations ago off of slave labor. And guess what? They're still rich. It's weird how you think those examples are supposed to make me feel better. System don't care how you feel about it. It is what it is. Bentley, take us home. The car confidently followed the glowing path in the windshield, and soon the city gave way to suburbs, and the suburbs gave way to the rich people enclave of Beaver Heights, which featured a golf course and palatial mansions with sprawling lawns and imposing fences. They followed a winding road designed to prevent anyone from driving faster than 15 miles an hour until they arrived at a massive wrought iron gate set into stone pillars carved into the shape of dragons. The moment they rolled to a stop, a holographic woman in stripper garb appeared outside Andre's door. Ornate glowing letters appeared across the gate that read, Casa de Asa. Andre rolled down his window, and the holographic stripper said, Welcome, visitor. I'm Candy. Sorry I'm not decent. I accidentally locked myself out of the house wearing nothing but this tiny thong. Mr. Livingston says he wants to know who is here and what size kimono you wear. To Zoe, Andre said, It's a recording. To the stripper, he said, Andre Knox with Zoe Livingston. Ash. Sorry. Zoe Ash. A moment's pause. The stripper looked into the air as if she was hearing instructions and then said, Arthur says he will see you now, and he wants to see all of you, if you know what I mean. Please, leave your inhibitions at the door. The stripper vanished, and the gate slid open. Zoe said, This is going to seem like kind of an odd question, but was Arthur Livingston 13 years old? Andre grinned and said, Take a look around the world, girl. Men don't never grow up. Get a bunch of us together with no ladies around, and it's all boner jokes and headlocks. Your daddy just had enough money that he didn't have to hide it like the rest of us. The Bentley 
drove itself through the gates, and instantly a million points of colored lights exploded into view. The cobblestone drive wound through a sprawl of manicured landscaping that at the moment was nothing but a support system for a constellation of Christmas lights. Every twenty feet or so along the path was a statue of a knight holding a sword, each wearing a red Santa Claus hat. The path was circling around a sprawling enclosure, housing two white Siberian tigers, one gnawing on some huge hunk of meat that Zoe hoped was not a human being. As they neared the end, they passed a life-sized Christmas nativity scene in which the traditional figures had been replaced with characters from Die Hard. Finally, the Bentley floated to a stop in front of a huge, dignified mansion that had clearly been designed and built by someone other than Zoe's father a sprawling, gothic thing that would be referred to as something manor in one of those old movies about English aristocrats. This house is a hundred years old, but has only been sitting on this plot of land for five. It was originally on the north shore of Long Island, the Gold Coast. Arthur had it shipped across the country and reassembled here, brick by brick. Andre led the way up to a pair of massive charcoal gray metal doors that were decorated with an etching depicting a tangle of nude women. These doors are solid bronze. They weigh seven tons. Each. The huge doors swung squeakily open for them as they approached, Zoe following Andre and cradling stench machine. Standing at the door was a terrifyingly thin, balding man in butler clothes, who looked about two hundred years old. Welcome back, Andre. A pleasure to meet you, Miss Ash. Andre nodded toward the man and said, Zoe, this is Carlton. They entered a cavernous foyer, at the center of which was a Christmas tree easily four times as tall as Zoe. Carlton led them around the tree, shoes clicking on the marble tile, toward a dual grand staircase that split off to opposite wings of the mansion. On the landing at the top of the stairs, they were suddenly accosted by a ghost, rising from the floor in an eerie bluish glow. Zoe almost tumbled backward down the stairs, and stench machine thrashed in her arms. The ghost was a hologram of Jacob Marley from A Christmas Carol, cleaning his chains together and saying, Scrooge, I were the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. Andre said, I'm going to apologize right now. Your daddy had a thing for holograms. He knew they were tacky, but said they made him feel like he was living in the future. Carlton the butler led them up the stairs and to the left. The house smelled of pine and varnish and floor wax. They reached an open door and passed into a room full of rich brown leather furniture, arranged in front of a fireplace large enough to roast a horse. Above the mantel was a gigantic stuffed and mounted buffalo head, wearing a Santa hat and a white fake beard. Carlton stopped at the doorway and said, Miss Ash has arrived. Up until that night, Zoe had no experience being either famous or infamous. And as such, she was unfamiliar with the feeling of meeting a group of people who didn't know her, and yet hated her. In this alien realm that seemed to have been entirely handcrafted in rich wood and leather, she was greeted by dismissive eyes, condescending smirks, and sideways glances that said, Oh, this ought to be good. It was clear that no matter what she did or said, everyone in this room intended to laugh about it later. Zoe was suddenly aware that her nose was running. She sniffed. The sound was deafening. There were three of them in the room, besides Zoe and Andre, all of whom were already standing when she entered. She spotted the silver suit and lacquered black hair of Will Blackwater right away, holding a glass of scotch because, of course, he was that kind of man. Next to him was the beautiful but annoyed-looking Chinese woman Zoe had seen on the platform with him earlier, wearing a pitch-black outfit that straddled the line between smart business suit and business-themed sex fetish costume, Hair pulled back to show off her neck, pearls, brazenly short skirt, calf muscles, heels. Leaning against the far corner with an empty scotch glass was the guy who earlier Zoe thought looked like he'd stepped out of a cartoon, a jowly face with grin lines between a white cowboy hat and a suit that had been tailored to not fit quite right. His body language said that the corner was his leaning spot, that he'd spend many a lawn meeting or brainstorming session there, always with a glass in his hand. A spot where he could see the whole room and take it in, while listening to the fireplace crackle and pop to his left. Zoe, on the other hand, had arrived there wearing a pair of muddy tennis shoes, the left one ruined by wet cement that was rapidly drying to a crust. She wore two long jeans that were frayed at the bottom, which were also too tight in the hips, even though they hadn't been when she had bought them last summer. 
She was carrying her denim jacket and wearing a black cardigan she inherited from her mother over an orange t-shirt bearing the logo for a band called Awesome Possum. A gray wool stocking cap was hiding a rat's nest of black and blue hair. She was clutching an angry, smelly cat and was wearing half a pound of its shed fur all over her torso. Fortunately, no one in the room knew she was also wearing a pair of pink underwear that said butt shirt across the back. The moment Andre stepped through the door, soft music faded in. A waka waka guitar that Zoe somehow recognized as the theme from Shaft, like it was Andre's personal theme song. Will looked annoyed and waited for the music to fade before he said, Zoe, glad you could make it. This here is Echo Lean, and the corner back there is Bud Billingsley. You've met Andre. We all worked closely with your father, and... I'm sorry. Please have a seat. Zoe let Stench Machine down and shuffled over to sit in a vast leather armchair that probably claimed the lives of twenty cows in its creation. But no one else sat, so she was now seated with her hands not in her lap like a nervous little girl while the four suits loomed over her. She saw Andre had acquired a scotch on the rocks. She wondered if there was a chute somewhere that just fired them into your hand the moment you walked in. She stared down at her ruined tennis shoes. These were the only shoes she had brought, and in fact were the only tennis shoes she owned. Her nose started dripping again, and she sniffed and wished everyone would turn their back so she could wipe it. The butler, Carlton, said, Can I get you anything, Miss Ash? Could you get me a pair of new shoes? She tried to laugh, but everyone just pursed their lips and shared their quick sidelong glances. In the distance, a wolf howled. Finally, Carlton asked, Is there anything else? No, I'm fine. Or maybe some water? She felt like she needed to ask for something, and that was the only thing that occurred to her. Very well. Carlton exited. Zoe tried to remind herself to breathe. Andre said, Look, we made a terrible first impression. Specifically, Will made a terrible first impression. We all owe you an apology. Your departed daddy included. So let me say it, for everyone here, it was good of you to come down and help us take care of this. And we'll make sure you're compensated for every terrible thing that has happened today. More than compensated. Right, Will? Absolutely. Nobody should have to go through what you went through back in Fort Drayton. And on the train earlier. Who was that guy? Who was that guy? I mean, I know he was after me because of, well, all this, but what was he? He could summon electricity or something. More glances. A silent decision was made to let Will explain, or rather, to decide what not to explain. We don't know. That's actually the issue at hand. Would you mind if we asked you some questions about that? I doubt I'll know anything useful. Did you see any kind of device hidden on him? Even something small, like something that could fit on his belt? No, I, I don't think so. Now, how many times would you say he did it? Made the electrical current arc between his fingers like that? I, I don't know. He liked to do it to, to show off. I'd say at least five times. He shot a glance at the Chinese woman, Echo. This was important, apparently. So? Zoe asked. Who was he? What was he? Just a man, with some kind of gadget as a weapon. We think he had it augmented into his hand. He shrugged as if this was an unimportant oddity that was worth no further thought. All of that, don't concern yourself with it. He's certainly not going to bother you anymore, and this room, right now, is the safest spot in the city for you. Maybe the safest spot in the whole world. Your father had enemies, as you know, but he spared no expense in protecting his home. The moment a foot bends a blade of grass anywhere on the grounds, a dozen armed guards spring into action. You will not be disturbed. Carlton emerged from behind her and placed onto an end table a sterling silver tray on which was arranged a pitcher of ice water, a glass, a bowl of lemon wedges, some sprigs of mint, a candy cane, and a box of Kleenex. He poured her a glass of water. The ice cubes were perfect spheres. Will continued. So, you know what you're here to do. There's a vault and only I can open it. It scans my brain or something. That's correct. There's no way to fake it. It has to be you. And once I open the vault, it's all over, right? All the contracts and bounties and stuff disappear? I'm just a regular person again. There was a pause, ever so slight, from Will before he said, Absolutely. He was lying. Zoe knew she wasn't going to get the truth just by asking. So instead she said, And we have no idea why he designated my brain as the key instead of yours, or hers, or literally anyone else's? Will shook his head and said, Trust me, no one is more surprised than we are. 
In fact, as far as we know, this is your first visit, so we're not even clear how the vault can be set with your brain's imprint if he never brought you in to let it scan you. Zoe started to say, I have no idea, but trailed off halfway through, when a memory suddenly popped into her head. In, in the fall, my mom made a doctor's appointment for me. She said it was something they had to do for the life insurance. But it was weird. They put me in something like an MRI machine, and I was in there for a solid hour. They told me they were checking for early Alzheimer's or something, but I don't know. It seemed fishy. Like, they wouldn't answer direct questions. Could Arthur have arranged that? Echo glanced at Will and said, Well, there's one mystery solved. Will asked, And how long ago was this? September, early October, around there. Glances, traces of confusion and alarm. This was a bombshell, apparently. Zoe tried to think of why, when it occurred to her that this meant she wasn't here due to some drunken last-minute decision or a mix-up with the vault's programming. Her father had planned all of this months in advance. In other words, he had known he was going to die. Or at least he was making preparation for the eventuality, and no one in the room had known. Echo shook her head and muttered to Will. I keep imagining him up there, laughing at us while we scrambled around the country trying to figure out exactly which trailer park he spilled his DNA in. Bud adjusted his cowboy hat and said, Bud adjusted his cowboy hat and said, Up there? Echo, I don't know exactly what religion you believe in that Arthur Livingston making it to heaven, but I reckon I want to join. Andre said, Eh, probably just bribed his way in. Will, raising his voice to cut off the banter, said, It doesn't matter. The daughter's here, let's get this over with. The daughter. Zoe realized he had already forgotten her name. She sniffed, wiped her nose with her sleeve, and took a drink from her water glass. She glanced around the room, a wreath on every wall, the stuffed and mounted buffalo wearing its stupid Santa hat and beard, yet another Christmas tree in the corner. Zoe and her mom had a plastic artificial tree they put together every year. It had a bare spot where two of the branches had broken off, so they had to keep that part facing the corner. Her estranged father she observed, apparently had a real tree in every room. Zoe suddenly realized that her yearly salary would not even pay to decorate this place for Christmas, and that her entire trailer wasn't big enough to serve as off-season storage for all the ornaments, lights, and holiday tchotchkes that encrusted the walls of this place. Once as a teenager, she had spent all Thanksgiving and Christmas with a cracked tooth. She endured the throbbing molar for six weeks, due to the waitlist to get into a dentist that accepted Medicaid. Every day at work with this pain stabbing like a shard of glass when she bit down on anything harder than pudding, the cost of one bottle of whatever scotch these people were drinking would have paid for her appointment. And now, here were Arthur Livingston's people, in suits that could probably put her through college, looking at her like she was a muddy dog running through their wedding reception. Her ears were getting hot. She pulled off her cap and shook her banes out of her eyes. Zoe let out a breath and said, And then what? Will answered, Then for us begins a very long and tedious task of sorting out the contents of the vault, whatever they are. But that's our problem, not yours. We will release the $50,000 from escrow and send you back home in whatever mode of transportation you prefer. Hell, we'll rent you a private plane. We'll let you take the company helicopter if you like. After that, we will never bother you again. And what if I see something in that vault I'm not supposed to see? Glances. Will clenched his jaw a little tighter. Echo pressed her lips together. The oil man in the corner, Bud, grabbed a bottle from a nearby cart and poured himself another glass of single malt or bourbon or whatever it was. He seemed to be trying to suppress a laugh. Will, who was trying very hard to hide the fact that he clearly wanted to strangle Zoe, said, See something. Like what? Arthur Livingston was a mob boss. You're the mob. Maybe the rumors were right. Maybe there's bodies in there. Or stolen stuff or drugs. Maybe just knowing the vault is here is dangerous information. Don't let your imagination get away from... Bzzz, stop. Don't play the hysterical woman card here. I've been through three attempted kidnappings in the last five hours. I mean, I'm the vault key, right? Well, why are you any different from all the other crazies that keep coming after me? Because you're wearing Armani? Maybe you don't want the key to your vault just walking around out there. Andre said, oh, Come on now, it's not like that. And despite the fact that you people all supposedly worked for my father, I still can't get over the fact that he didn't make any of you the key. Why not, if you're so trustworthy? Hey, for all I know, you're the ones he was specifically trying to keep out of the vault. For all I know, you're the ones who had him killed. She wanted to see what Will's reaction would be to this. 
The reaction was barely suppressed rage. Maybe, said Will. All of this is the result of nothing more than the fact that your father, despite extreme wealth and power, had a history of making terrible decisions. Echo smirked at the inference that Will was in fact looking at one of Arthur's terrible decisions right here. Zoe literally bit her tongue and took a moment to gather herself. So, she said evenly, my question is, how do I know that after I'm done, the sedan I climbed in isn't going to take me out in the woods where Tex over there will pull out a little gun and shoot me in the back of the head? See, I know for a fact you won't do that right now, because I haven't opened your vault yet, and as you said, it doesn't open for a corpse. As long as it stays closed and you want what's inside, I'm safe. But the moment it opens, the value of my life drops to zero, and I, unlike you, care nothing whatsoever about what's in there. So, Mr. Blackwater, I need you to sit down and explain Arthur Livingston's bad decision. How are you going to make it worth my while to open that vault for you, and how you can guarantee my safety after? Silence. Something popped in the fireplace. In the corner, Bud laughed from around his drink and said, <laughs> I like her. Echo Lingan, on the other hand, made an expression that could suck the laughter out of a child's birthday party. She turned on her heels and said, Well, she's definitely Arthur's daughter. Zoe stared in Echo's back and said, If I hear anybody say that again, I'm never opening that vault. Zoe grabbed a tissue from the tray and loudly blew her nose. Will gathered himself and said, I understand your concerns completely. I said I want you to sit down and explain it to me. Stop looming over me. It's rude. Will took a breath and seemed to count to ten in his head, then took a seat on the leather sofa in front of her. Probably a hundred cows murdered for that one. Let's just approach this logically. What you're asking is impossible. You want me to negotiate with you while you maintain the assumption that I'm operating in bad faith. After all, if we were the kind of people you just accused us of being, then my role would be to say whatever it takes to placate you, knowing we'd never have to follow through on whatever offer is made. So instead, how about you tell me what you want in the way of assurances, and I'll see what I can do to accommodate you. But keep in mind, time is very short. Why is time short? I don't have to be back at work until Monday. You don't understand- No, listen. Everything you said is right. The problem isn't what you're offering or failing to offer me. The problem is you- I don't trust you, so before I can even begin to think about this, I need to convince myself that you're on the level. All right, and how will we go about doing that precisely? I don't know, but it's late and I'm tired. Is there a spare bed in one of the thousand rooms of this house? We were really hoping to have this resolved tonight. Well, to get over this disappointment, you'll just have to console yourself with the fact that you have absolutely everything else you want in life. Will started to speak again, but Andre put a hand on his shoulder and said, How about you don't piss her off, eh? The world will still be here when the sun comes up tomorrow. He turned toward the doorway where Carlton had materialized at some point and said, Can you get a room ready for Zoe? It is already done, sir. Her suitcase is up there as well. Of course it is. See, it's all good. Zoe, we even retrieved your bag. You left it on the train platform when you set that dude's dick on fire. So, get a good night's rest, have Carlton make you some waffles in the morning, and we'll figure this all out tomorrow while I nurse the hangover I'm about to cause. Andre smoothed his lapel and walked out, while Zoe silently planned how she was going to escape this terrible place. 10. The guest bedroom suite they set Zoe up in had its own bathroom, media room, and minibar. The covers were turned down on a keen-sized four-poster bed that would not have fit in her bedroom back home unless it was folded up like a taco shell. There was a touchscreen on the end table that, after tinkering with it, Zoe realized controlled the firmness, texture, and temperature of the mattress. Her suitcase was placed neatly on the bed next to a stack of white bath towels, the one on top folded into the shape of a swan. Carlton had found a cat bed somewhere and had set it in the corner of the room. Stench machine was curled up asleep on the floor next to it. Zoe sat on the bed and stared at the door. She got up and locked it, but that was stupid because surely they had a key, it was their home. She scooted over an end table that had an expensive looking lamp on it so it blocked the door. The table wouldn't delay someone breaking in for long, but would maybe give her a few seconds to try to escape out the window. Plus, she would die knowing that she had made them break one of their expensive lamps, so screw them. She looked around the room for a weapon. The closest thing she could find was a bag of golf clubs that was propped up in one corner. 
She pulled out the heaviest-looking driver and sat on the bed with it across her lap. It didn't make her feel any safer. She had let Andre bring her here to get her away from the craziness in the van and the much larger group of crazies known as all of the citizens of Tabula Rasa, but she had no illusions about opening Livingston's stupid vault and then riding off into the sunset with the escrow money. She wasn't some little princess from the suburbs who just graduated college with a humanities degree. She knew what people were really like. They'd kill her just to save the price of a plane ticket. So her plan was to wait for everyone else to leave or go to bed, did they all live here, and just slip out of the house. She sat there, gripping the club, and listened. There was something very off about the sound this place made, and Zoe eventually figured out that the weird sound was what other people knew as peaceful silence. Zoe had been living in her mom's trailer because she'd had to move out of Caleb's place when they broke up, Caleb being the guy she thought at one time she was going to marry and have babies with. So for two months, she had been sleeping on a futon next to an aluminum wall, near a window that had been cracked by an errant fist and repaired with scotch tape. All of the trailer park noises bled through into the room as easily as if they had been playing in the yard. Always somebody revving a gasoline motor, a couple arguing or having loud sex, a barking dog, or, more likely, twenty barking dogs. But the Casa de Asa was dead silent. She could hear her own breathing. So this was what a house sounded like when it had solid walls and, beyond them, acres of gated land unto which the poor were not allowed. Zoe hated it. She didn't have much of a plan beyond escaping the grounds of the estate. Maybe she would get out and find some hole to hide in. Maybe find the tabula rasa slums and make some friends. Lay low, like they say in the movies. Maybe the mob would eventually decide it was more trouble to go after her than to just get somebody else to break into their stupid safe. She hadn't witnessed them doing anything illegal, so they didn't have anything to fear from her running to the FBI or whoever was still enforcing the law around here. Zoe grabbed a stench machine and curled up with him on the bed feeling warmth and annoyance radiating off him as he meowed and made half-hearted attempts to wriggle free. She closed her eyes and immediately saw Jacob, his brain fried in his skull, staring blearily and drooling. She felt so stupid. Handsome rich kid flirting with dumpy trailer trash to win money in a day as a blink celebrity. Millions of people listening in while she swooned and giggled and tried to impress him. A vast constellation of strangers she'd never meet, laughing at her. That prompted Zoe to turn on the wall feed in the bedroom. They had one of those projection units rich people have, a fist-sized dome in the ceiling that could project the feed on any wall you wanted, and tuned into the Hunt for Livingston's Key event to see what was going on in the fascinating lives of the various people who were trying to capture, kill, or torture her. The most popular feed at the moment belonged to the League of Badass, the ragtag group of morons who had chased them in their van earlier. They were back at their headquarters, which appeared to be somebody's garage, leaning over a table in front of their busted-up van, going over strategy. Their leader, the muscle guy with the red mohawk and sleeves of tribal tattoos, was explaining to the camera that Zoe was safely in her father's estate and, as far as they knew, could be opening Livingston's vault as they spoke. But then he explained why this was by no means the end of the hunt. Sure enough, Will Blackwater had lied. The $5 million contract this Molech guy had put on her, it turned out, was not just about abducting her so he could stick her into the keyhole of Arthur Livingston's vault. No, it was also about getting revenge for Dollhead Guy. He had been an employee of Molech's, and he was now dead. Zoe was startled to hear this. Could a person actually die from a small, whiskey-fueled crotch fire? Maybe he had a prior medical condition. But more importantly, it meant that escaping the estate would change nothing about the fact that that there was still a multi-million dollar bounty on her head. In fact, it would only double the number of people who were looking for her. Her whole plan had fallen apart in ten seconds. Zoe closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead. She supposed someone with more experience in dealing with this kind of thing would know how to work this to her advantage. After all, if Molech's people wanted her dead, but her father's people needed her alive to open the vault, then her father's people had motivation to protect her from Molech's. But... How long would she be able to keep that up before they decided it wasn't worth the trouble? If she was alive, but refusing to open their vault, then she was no more useful to them than if she was a corpse. Zoe flipped around the Hunt feed and found someone had assembled a highlight reel of the players involved. She brought up one labeled Arthur Livingston, the suits. There was a video of the four of them exiting a black sedan in slow motion while ominous music played. A gravelly voice said, 
Arthur Livingston's death has left behind a power vacuum, with four members of his ruthless inner circle vying for control. In the criminal underworld, they are known as the Suits. Andre Knox, a.k.a. Black Mountain, Livingston's deadly enforcer. Michelle Echo Lean, the Chinese computer expert and sexy seductress. Bud, the regulator Billingsley. And finally, Will Blackwater, the magician, Arthur Livingston's cold-blooded right-hand man. Seven years ago, when a cartel hitman went rogue and made an attempt on the life of Andre Knox, the dismembered corpse of the gunman was found on Arthur Livingston's doorstep 12 hours later, along with an apology note from the head of the cartel. When a Ukrainian mob tried to horn in on Livingston's territory a year later, Livingston asked for a face-to-face -to, -face to avoid all-out war. Witnesses say the suits met behind locked doors with a dozen mob captains. After only four minutes, both groups filed out of the room. By nightfall, the Ukrainians left the city, never to return. Not a single shot was fired. But, strangest of all, when a federal indictment came down for a fifth member of Livingston's inner circle named Logan Knight, Arthur Livingston gave a press conference in which he made the bizarre assertion that no such man had ever existed. With no further explanation, all charges were dropped soon after. Well, that was terrifying. And not at all helpful. Zoe noticed they had made one of those profile trailers for her and she couldn't resist. She told it to play. 22-year-old Zoe Ash, a devious and busty... She quickly swiped off the screen. Zoe fell back onto the bed and covered her eyes. She had no idea what to do now and couldn't think straight. The long trip... The roller coaster adrenaline rush, the cold night, the warm bed. She lay on her side and felt herself melting into the mattress. The stench machine was now prowling around the room. Then Zoe finally realized he was looking for food because she hadn't fed him, because she was horrible at everything. She dug out two cans of cat food from her suitcase. Yes, she traveled with cans of cat food in her luggage like the crazy cat lady she was destined to become, and looked around for a fork. Stench Machine ate a mixture of two different brands, and she had to mash them together. She was pretty sure it was some kind of chemical reaction from the combination that made him smell so bad, but it was the only thing he would eat without following the meal with two hours of disapproving looks that would devastate Zoe in her current emotional state. The room was forkless. Logically, she could just mix the stuff together with her fingers or whatever random object she could find in the room, but she had no desire to put her fingers in cat food and, to be honest, there was something else tempting her out of the bedroom, and that was curiosity. So, telling herself she was doing it for her cat, she scooted the table lamp away from the door and stepped cautiously into the hallway, trying to imagine how a person would find a common eating utensil in a sprawling palace like this. She thought about going back for her golf club and decided if the situation deteriorated into a golf club duel to the death, she probably was already screwed. She tried to see in the darkened hall and took a step, wincing at the sound of the squeaky floorboards trying to rat her out. As stealthily as possible, she took a left toward the stairs and immediately crashed loudly through a low pile of boxes. Shoes went spilling everywhere. She squinted in the darkness and saw nine boxes containing nine pairs of shoes, three different styles similar to the pair she had ruined, each in three different sizes ranging from six and a half to seven and a half. She found a note from Carlton, the butler, apologizing for not asking her size first, but saying he had tried to give her a range of choices and that she should let him know if none was satisfactory. Zoe imagined a pair of goons forcing some footlocker manager to open a store at gunpoint in the middle of the night to get their boss's daughter a new pair of sneakers. Zoe picked up the cat again and patted down the stairs, then almost screamed when once again Jacob Marley's ghost came oozing out of the floor when she reached the landing. Scrooge! Stench Machine jumped out of her arms and bolted down the stairs, across the foyer, zipping through an arched doorway on the ground floor. Zoe followed him through the arch and found herself in a long dining room with a table that could seat probably 50 guests. The cat darted through chair legs and prowled cautiously through a doorway at the other end. Zoe followed him into a hallway. At the end of the hall was a boarded-up door with red tape crisscrossed over it that said, Warning, Mold, Do Not Enter. She headed in the other direction, but Stench Machine wouldn't follow. Instead, he prowled around the mold door, sniffing and pawing at it, as if there was a mouse or something behind it. As Zoe went to pick him up, Stench Machine took a step forward and passed through the door. Partly, anyway, his butt and tail were sticking out. Zoe went to the mold door and passed her hand through it. The door was yet another hologram.
She could see their little projector on the ceiling, and waving her hand in front of it, could make entire vertical slices of the door vanish where she was blocking the beam. The illusion had been hiding a real door, another heavy one made of bronze, a foot beyond the fake one. She tried the handle, but it was locked, because of course it was. Was this the vault? She didn't care to find out. She picked up stench machine and headed down the hall. Then the big door clicked and squeaked behind her. A stern voice said, Who are you? How did you get in here? A guy she had never seen before had leaned out through the hologram, looking like a disembodied head had been nailed to the mold door like a hunter's trophy. Then the man stepped out toward her, a bald guy with a gun in the shoulder holster over a tight black turtleneck. He had cop eyes. A voice from inside the room behind him said, That's the girl, Arthur's daughter. That voice was Will. Zoe had assumed everyone had left, but apparently Will had business in their secret room. The bald guy retreated back inside the room, and Will leaned out past the hologram, his posture suggesting he was holding the door closed behind it. They were probably having an orgy back there. Again, Zoe had no intention of knowing either way. He asked, What are you doing here? Nothing. I was just trying to find it. It doesn't matter. Is that... is that the vault? Yes, this is the vault. That's why we're all standing inside it and the door is open. I don't... The vault's in the basement. This is a private conference room. Finish doing what you're doing and go back to bed. We'll come get you in the mor- Hey! Stench machine had twisted out of Zoe's grasp and darted through the hologram and through the gap in the real door beyond. Zoe ran in after him, shoving past Will through the metal door. Will yelled, Stop! Then grabbed her wrist and twisted. Zoe went to one knee. The room had flown into chaos as the cat had jumped up onto a table, trying to make off with what looked like a hunk of gray meat. The bald guy who had met Zoe at the door snatched the cat by the scruff of the neck and looked like he was going to tear him in half with his bare hands. Zoe screamed at Will to let go of her, but he was dragging her backward, back out of the door. Her wrist felt like it was going to break. From her knees, Zoe twisted her body around and bit the first thing on Will she could find, his thigh. He cursed and let her go. Zoe got to her feet and was about to demand her cat back, then she saw what was sitting on the table, and everyone saw that she saw, and everything ground to a halt. Lying on the table was a severed human hand.